Perfect, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. I live in Amsterdam, actually, so um, when you come here for 30 plus hours travel and I get here on my bike in five minutes, that's a big difference. Um, as you can see, I use the sign language. We have an interpreter in the front who translates my, in my story in the, my speech to you in uh, English and the other way around as well. Uh, well, Peter's already told me who I, uh, who I am, something about my background, and I now work with ABN AMRO Bank. I'm an inclusive and interaction designer. I also work with accessibility, and I also use interpreters on a daily basis at my work uh, for all kinds of things, meetings with coworkers, presentations like today, um, and all kinds of other meetings with clients, for instance. So the government in the Netherlands uh, provides interpreting uh, hours. If we need interpreters, we can ask for them. Uh, and all interpreters of all deaf people go through that, uh, that governmental body. So they uh, interact with many, many de deaf people on a daily basis. People uh, need interpreters for work, for all kinds of situations. Uh, but still, they send us letters like these. Please call us if you need some uh, extra information. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so talking about being deaf, what does that really mean? Well, ob obviously it means that you cannot hear, uh, but there's more to it. There are two main uh, mainstream ideas about it, perspectives about it. Deaf with uh, lower cap D is used to describe or identify anyone who has a severe hearing problem. And then on the other hand, deaf with a capital D, is used by deaf people to identify themselves as culturally deaf uh, and people who have a strong deaf identity. If you want to understand how uh, deafness influences web accessibility and vice versa, it's uh, good to understand how deaf people see themselves in the world. And many deaf people don't, um, in, don't see themselves as being disabled. They see themselves as a cultural linguistic minority. There are many causes to becoming deaf. You can become deaf by meningitis, by an illness, old age, medicine use, uh, hearing damage, and it can be hereditary. And you can also be born deaf, like me. And for me, that is not an issue, that's not a problem. It makes me who I am, and it's fine. Many deaf people use a sign language as I do now, uh, Dutch sign language is my native language, and sign languages are not simple gestural codes based on uh, a spoken language, they're not pantomime, but they are real four-dimensional spatial languages. They don't have a written form. Grammar and syntax are very different from those of spoken languages, and they rely heavily on facial expression to convey meaning and emphasis. I just want to show you a little video which will not be interpreted because I think you know the story and it will show you, illustrate how um, facial expressions are being used in sign language. <laughs> Many, many times we get asked the question if sign language is universal. That is not the case. Every country has their own sign language as they have their own spoken language. So there is French sign language, there is American sign language, and there is also Dutch sign language. And within those di sign languages, there are also dialects. 
And you have to understand that the primary language of a country, a spoken language, is for many deaf people their second language. You can compare deaf readers, for instance, for instance, with second language readers. It's important to understand um, that deaf people see themselves as a cultural uh, linguistic minority rather than people with a disability. And that means that we are not, um, we're not able to, of, or people use the spoken language of their country as a second language. And that causes, causes a problem because deaf people be fall between the hearing community and the disabled community. We don't have physical problems, we don't need physical adjust adjustments, but we need cultural and linguistic adjustments. I want to try to explain to you how the grammar for sign languages works. Um, in, the English you in English, you would say, would you like to have lunch with me? In sign language, you wouldn't say it that way. You would say, you, me, lunch, go. Uh, and another example is the yellow ball is in the cupboard. In sign language, you would go to the cupboard first. There's a cupboard there. The yellow ball is inside. Be careful to notice that this grammar, a different grammar, doesn't mean that it's more simple, more simplified, it's just simply different. It differs from other languages as French and English differ from each other and from Russian, uh, for instance. As a community, the deaf community is very small, but also very diverse. There is a big group of uh, people who are deaf who also have additional disabilities. They have learning problems or cognitive uh, challenges. There is a, a slightly smaller group um, that use a sign language primarily uh, and use their um, the country's spoken language as a second language. They can express themselves in their sign language completely, but if you ask them to write down something, then they make mistakes. And then there's a, the top group. Those are people who are bilingual, who master the spoken language of their country and their sign language uh, really well, but that's a very, very small group. So now, designing for deaf people, but actually for everybody else, what's important is to um, recognize exclusion by identifying a problem, and then you get to in inclusive design. Uh, and there is a, not a one-size-fits-all solution for many uh, issues. And I will give you some tips, some ideas to improve your design for deaf people, but also for others. When you write for the web, that's one of the important things. There are some good tips from a list apart um, and usability.gov. If you use these, you can improve your readability, uh, and not only for deaf people, but for other people too. Like, for instance, these people. 50% of US adults can't read a book written at eighth grade level. That's a very big group. Many people drop out of formal education uh, because of dys dyslexia, poor vision, uh, not identified learning issues, or they simply haven't found a learning environment that fits, fits their needs. Also in the Netherlands, one in six Dutch adults have difficulty in reading, writing, and or calculating. And that for deaf people, that number is even higher, that is 80%. So the tips that I'm going to show you will help you improve the readability of your website. So use headings and subheadings, make one point per paragraph. Use short sentences, seven to 10 words per line. Use bulleted lists. Use easy accessible language whenever possible. Write in a journalistic style, uh, make your point and then explain it. Write in an active form. Avoid unnecessary, uh, unnecessary jargon and slang, which can increase the user's cognitive load. Use images, diagrams, multimedia solutions for a visual translation of the content. Chunk your content. Use white space. Um, and include a glossary, so specialized vocabulary. And provide definitions in simple language. This would be good for medical uh, terms, for instance. There is a very large group of people who read, when they read a website, they only read 20 to 28%. 
they read websites differently from uh, pieces of paper, text on paper. They want to find things fast. And they don't have the patience to go through everything on the site. And this is not just about me. This is for people who use uh, um, language as a second language as well. And everybody else in the world as well. You too. Subtitles might be a good idea. It's a very good idea for me. I am very happy with uh, um, subtitles. I like to read. It gives full access. For me, that is not a problem. Um, but it can be a problem for some people. Synonyms, wordplay, language jokes are not always familiar to deaf people who don't use them in the same way. Uh, so that might pose some difficulties. And as I said before, uh, lang sign languages don't have written forms, so if you give someone subtitles, then they have a written translation from a language uh, that they have to read, but they don't have a written form of their own language, so that can also be a problem sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the point of subtitles, obviously, is that you convey the content, the meaning, the information. It's not meant to test the language uh, capabilities of your audience, so it doesn't have to be verbatim or like this. This is really not necessary. Um, there are also other solutions. Transcripts are out there, and those are awesome too, but they also still pose problems because large chunks of text are really hard to read for some people for the average deaf people. Multimedia solutions are a very good solution. I like, for instance, this one. When you translate the content uh, in sign language by a native signer. And this is an example from a website for a political party here in the Netherlands. And they have um, translated their election program into Dutch sign language, which is very good, but it's also very costly and takes a lot of time. Because if something changes in the content, you have to redo the whole video again. So yeah. Um, for me, um, I don't have the patience to look through the whole video just to find one bit of information, uh, but it's very much appreciated by many, many deaf people. It's a good solution for important uh, information and complex information like politics, insurance, uh, information on taxes or um, medical uh, information. And I think it would be good if you have a website that would have an icon there like this with the two hands that si signals to people that a sign language translation is available and they can click on that and see it, watch it if they need to. And you can do the same with uh, uh, glossaries for specific terms. Me, myself, I like to read uh, the text, but people can also opt for a sign language translation. And this would mean that users can choose the solution that fits their needs best. Also very important, uh, multiple contact options. Most of the time, you're only required to fill out a phone number. That is something that is not helpful for me. There are many, many other options. You can use WhatsApp, Skype, all kinds of chat programs, uh, email even. If I want to see my family doctor right now, I have to go through an interpreting service. I have to call them and they will then call the doctor, which is a good solution, but still not the best way. This is a very good example. This is a British TV company, it's called Sky, and they have uh, a whole load of contact options for people. You can even address them in BSL, British Sign Language, or by uh, text, which is awesome. So yeah, phone numbers. More and more I see uh, this field in the in a form when you buy something or something else. Uh, yeah, well, phone number is mandatory. Um, and it's very annoying because I know that this will happen. <laughs> this is actually what happened to me. I was called by this phone company three or four times a day during a whole week. What do I do with this thing, with this phone that's ringing and I can't answer? So please, when you design something, make sure that people can opt out of uh, information that you don't use or that they don't find necessary. The World Health Organization had a perspective on disability. It used to be, they used to say that uh, it was a personal health condition, but the perspective has changed. They now call it a mismatched human interaction. And this um, 
connects to a research that's been done uh, by Microsoft on inclusive design, which makes use of uh, the whole scala of human differences. And uh, we can make sure that people participate in real life um, and in uh, the digital world as well. If we make sure that everybody participates, um, if we know where the problems lie, that everybody can be a fully participation in the world. So in this case, uh, it's not meant to you know, check a checklist uh, for accessibility, but rather being a future for inclusive design. If we can make open and accessible design for everybody, everybody can participate. I don't have a disability. Society makes me disabled. It's the mismatch with society. As I said before, I don't see myself as a person with a disability, but the boundaries being posed by society make me disabled. It's important to recognize exclusion, and this happens when we solve uh, problems with our own biases. Seek out exclusion, understand why people are being exclu excluded. And sometimes exclusion is like temporary, you can have a broken arm and you have to do things with one hand, or uh, you look into bright lights that you can't see someone on the other side. Um, and also, exclusion is sometimes situational. People move through different environments and adapt their abilities accordingly. And when you, for instance, order food abroad and you don't understand the menu, or if it's loud in a pub somewhere, or when you're a new parent with a baby on your arm, you have to do one things with one hand as well. It's important to learn from diversity. Inclusive design means that people are the center of the process from the start. And humans are, we as humans are very, are amazing in adapting to different uh, settings. And if we know how this, this adaptations, these adaptations work, those are the keys to new and inclusive design. And seek out people who have experience, daily experience with ex exclusion, because they are the ones um, that th are the experts, your users, not you. So for one, extend to many. Inclusive design works well for a broad scala of related problems. It's not a one size fits all, but one size fits one. And then eventually others will benefit from that as well. Um, an example would be the subtitles that have been created for deaf and hard of hearing people, but now um, in, on Facebook, 85% of videos are being watched without sound. Also, if a video has subtitles, they will, people will finish the clip twice as much. Oh. Um, and also, uh, many users are hearing. I wanna show you a video here. Hello, my name is Thomas, and this is Navid. We are inventors in the Lemelson MIT Student Prize competition. Access to communication is a basic fundamental human right, and every single person deserves to be a part of the global community. However, those who are deaf or mute communicate differently than everyone else. They primarily use sign language, while the rest of the world communicates verbally. This puts the deaf-mute community at a disadvantage, because like a foreigner in another country, they can't communicate like everybody else. What we decided to do is create gloves that translate sign language into text and speech. We have had extensive work with individuals in the disabled community, and have seen firsthand their daily struggles. We wanted to develop something that would help the deaf and mute better communicate with the rest of the world without changing how they already interact with each other. By simply putting on a pair of gloves, those who utilize American Sign Language can now communicate with the rest of the world the same way they communicate with each other. The gloves work by utilizing sensors on the hand and wrist to measure hand position and hand movement. The gloves then send this data to the computer via Bluetooth for processing. Once the computer recognizes and interprets the sign, it then outputs the corresponding word or phrase in text and speech. If you were to say, hello, I'm well, thank you, it would look something like this. Hello, 
I'm well. Thank you. And just like that, we've translated American Sign Language into spoken English instantly. There are approximately 70 million deaf-mute people in the world who use sign language, but over 7 billion humans on the planet. Our device revolutionizes the way these two communities understand and interact with each other. Currently, there is no commercial sign language translator on the market. With this invention, over 70 million people achieve a new level of independence. 70 million people gain access to a new job, and 70 million people secure an improved quality of life, all with the help of a pair of gloves. We believe that access and inclusiveness are catalysts for change. These gloves were crafted with this principle in mind and seek to promote a more unified global community. Well, I have a couple of comments on this uh, uh, video that I don't agree with. Um, there is a bit of a poor choice in words like disabled community, deaf and mute, um, those kinds of words. Uh, I don't see myself as being disabled, as I, as I told you, and deaf mute is something that I don't really identify with. Also very funny that it works only one way. So we see this boy signing to this girl, and then the girl talks back to the boy. Hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> and also, they say that, you know, now all, everybody can now communicate, but not everybody in the world knows American Sign Language. So sign languages are culturally bound languages. They're very rich. They have strong facial expressions, as I mentioned before. And it's impossible to translate all of that in one glove, as you saw in the video I showed you before. We, as designers, want to generate ideas and designs based on what we know. That's what we do. We use our own frameworks. And we strive to work solutions uh, to improve lives for everybody else, to make things go well, um, that work, and, and solutions that work well, and we want to solve needs. The problem only is if we use our own skills as a baseline, and then our solutions might work for some people, but not for everybody else. We have to be careful of our ability bias. In the world, we have 7.4 billion people, and it's impossible to create one design for everybody. But if you design for people and not with people, then, uh, you will, then that will cause exclusion. And I would like to end this quote with, uh, end this talk with this quote from James Charlton, nothing about us without us. Thank you very much.